Our biology really tells us that at our hearts, we are libertarians. Go figure. <laughs> Everybody, thanks for having me. I'm having a ball. Is this a great weekend or what? Come on. And we engineered the weather, so it'd be perfect. Okay, so we'll have you do uh, some experiments with me today. Okay, so if you would take your right foot and just do a clockwise circle, clockwise circle, clockwise circle, and then go in the air and draw a big number six. Big number six. Oh, what happened? John, what happened? You went, yeah. Wait, you went the wrong direction. Aren't you in charge of you? <laughs> now I'm confused. Okay, so why did you do that? Your foot went the wrong direction, right? Once you drew that six. So Robert knows the reason why this happens, and I'll tell you the reason later. I'm not going to tell you now. It's a good neurologic reason why this happens. What does that tell us? Who's in charge of you? Right? At some level, we are volitional beings. We can choose the way we go through life. But at another level, we can't choose. That is, we're driven by underlying unconscious processes. And if we want to understand at a fundamental level how individuals make decisions, then we need to interrogate the brain and find those underlying unconscious processes. So I started doing this about 10 years ago, investigating the way people make decisions in the laboratory field founded by our friend Vernon Smith, to understand why people made certain decisions that seem not to have made sense. Okay, so let me give you another example of that. So this is an experiment you can do next weekend when you're at a cocktail party and you meet someone new and how are you, what are you doing? You can say, I just learned that markets are moral. Okay, so the person you tell this to will have one of two reactions in my experience. What will be anger? What's wrong with you? Are you an insane person? Have you not seen CNN? Okay. <laughs> the second will be these sort of sad views that we give to individuals who are mentally challenged. <laughs> so it's okay. So we understand. All right. So I want to try to convince you at the level of the brain that markets are moral. Okay. So I joked with Amy that I would call this talk why everything you think is true actually is true. Okay. So. So I just made a really bold statement, and you need to say now, prove it. How do I know that, right? Well, I have philosophy, I have sociology, I have this and that, but could I get to not only the level of how the brain works, but actual brain chemistry? So I started looking at this issue 10 years ago. I thought, why is it that we live in a world in which we can engage in all kinds of transactions, so generally wealth-improving transactions, good for you, good for me, in which there's a low level of cheating in the United States. Right? Very low level of cheating. So when we looked at how people ran these experiments, I should say that uh, when I lived in Arizona, I randomly would come by and knock on Vernon's door, and he nicely never told me to get away. And I said, what happens in your experiments? Why do people do what they do? And for this particular experiment, where, which I'll tell you about in a minute, where we have subjects who can invest with a stranger in the lab, their money can grow, but then this stranger has a decision to make, which is, do I share the gains from this transaction with the other person who invested with me, or do I keep it all? And if you do this one time and you're anonymous, the standard models in economics said, money good, you should keep the money. And yet almost no one did that. So I asked Vernon, why is it? What do people tell you in these experiments? And you know what the most common answer is? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Students couldn't report why they were doing what they were doing. Okay, so now we're in this corner. We're stuck. How can we understand why people reciprocate in transactions even when they don't have to? So for crazy reasons that have to do with my weird background, which you can hear about later, I decided I would try to run this experiment that Vernon invented, and after people made their decision, take four tubes of blood from their arm. Okay. This is the birth of what my former dean called vampire economics. <laughs> okay. So I am a vampire. I'm outed now. I have a, blood full, a freezer full of blood in my office. What we found is that a particular chemical that 
uh, at that time in humans was only known to contract the uterus during birth and be released when women breastfed and was released while both sexes had sex, but that was it. A reproductive hormone, in fact, was released when someone invested their money with you. And this hormone is called oxytocin, which many of you now have heard about. But in 2001, one of my colleagues said, why would you study that? That's the world's stupidest idea. It's just a female hormone. So if it's for women, of course, it can't be very important. This was a man, <laughs> right? But men make this too. And in particularly group living animals like us, we have this hormone released by men and women, not only for reproductive stimuli, but in fact, when we have positive social interactions. That's what we showed. And so one of the fundamental issues, I think, that gets back to um, why markets are moral is that we have a biology for reciprocation. That's the basis for trade. Okay. So when we are trusted, when someone wants to do a business deal with us, right, we want to reciprocate in that deal because that's what we normally do. Okay, this leads opens a couple of questions. Number one, what happens when a deal goes bad? And what about Bernie Madoff? Okay, so let's take those two on. Okay, so we also asked about that. What if someone doesn't play nice? What happens in the brain? We found is that we also have not only a biology of reciprocation, but we have a biology for punishment. Why is this interesting? So the less you play nice with me, the more, particularly for men, the more I want to punish you, we see this associated with a spike in testosterone. So the male response to you not playing nice is, I'm going to take you outside and beat on you. Okay, so I will punish you. Why is that important? Because if I know through my experience in life, that if I don't play nice, I'll get an aggressive response, I'll play nicer. So just the threat of punishment means that I now have to adjust my behavior given the environment I'm in. So I don't need Big Brother watching me, right? I don't need a camera for every transaction. I don't need to uh, you know, have my DNA taken every time I uh, slice my uh, credit card. What I need to know is that the expectation is that you're going to reciprocate. And if you don't, people don't like it, and they're going to try to do something about it. So we may have formal institutional structures that allow us to do this without beating people up. But the impulse is the same. We want to reciprocate. We are hyper-social creatures. Trade is deep in our DNA. So oxytocin first appeared, a variant of it, in fish 400 million years ago. So it's not like trade is something new that humans uh, impose on us. In fact, the party line is that somehow, you know, exchange in markets degrades human dignity. Uh, it, it puts a price in everything. It's somehow exploitative. Right? That's, you know, sounds like Marxism, but it goes back to Aristotle and to Confucius and many others. Not true at all. When you look at the biology, we are set up to interact with each other. And exchanging this for that is one of those interactions. Now again, if I give you the money, you don't give me the goods, I'm going to go after you. That's the way we are. Okay? And I'm certainly going to tell all my friends and ostracize you. So now we have what essentially is a self-organizing trade system. It's that system of trade within a stable environment that has produced enormous increases in wealth. Markets are, as you know, the best and fastest way to increase prosperity humans have ever found. And markets are the most natural thing for us to trade in. We are set up for it. It makes perfect sense to us. It is consistent with our human nature. Right? So that should make you feel good. We are set up to do this. It's not an imposition from above. It's just what we do naturally. And so if you've gone to primitive areas, which many of you have, you see markets evolve right away. And in fact, interesting anthropological evidence shows that when you see uh, underdeveloped and, and small-scale societies, as they start to trade, they actually become more fair. So when anthropologists do experiments just like Vernon did and I did in the lab, in which you can exchange goods and have an unfair or fair outcome, the more you trade, the more, in fact, people in the laboratory or field laboratory want to share the benefits. So trade really is about sharing benefits. Why? Because life is long, we have histories, people find out about us, and if they say, John's not a fair dealer, everyone avoids him, right? He is no longer part of the social group that's not adapted for a social creature. Okay? So our biology really tells us that at our hearts, we are libertarians. <laughs> Go figure. Okay? So you can try the experiment I suggested at the next cocktail party and see what people do, but that's the, the story you can tell them. 
We're built for this. Okay, what about the Bernie Madoffs? Is there cheating? For sure. And if you leave a cash stack on the table, people will try to grab that stack of cash, for sure. We found in our experiments with thousands and thousands of people, not only college students, but real free roaming humans, that in fact, 5% of them don't release oxytocin on stimulus. Okay. These 5% have very unusual psychological profiles. They look a lot like psychopaths. Okay. <laughs> so they are self-deceptive, they're deceptive, they are manipulative, um, they don't attach to one person at a time. So they really don't form relationships well. And they're kind of in survival mode. So what produces this? One is you get a bad genetic draw. This doesn't work, this system. The second is that you have a bad childhood. So if I neglect or abuse you enough in animals and humans, the system doesn't develop. I don't get this feedback system. And the third is I'm having a really bad day. The dog died, I got in a car accident, I'm very stressed. So high levels of stress put us in survival mode. We may be normally nice people, but I'm really grumpy today and I'm gonna behave badly. Okay, so it turns out in these 10 years worth of experiments that this same mechanism, oxytocin release, motivates virtuous behaviors of every sort. And these are not hypothetical virtuous behaviors. These are stack of money, share it, keep it, do what you want. And when we induce oxytocin release, or when we manipulate it pharmacologically, we raise oxytocin levels in the brain, people are more generous, more compassionate, more trustworthy, honest, sacrificial. So this is really the substance that differentiates us from almost every other animal. We like being around the other humans. And one of the things we like being around the other humans is we can trade with them. So Adam Smith identified this in The Wealth of Nations. When the extent of the market is broad, the opportunities for wealth creation are also broad. Okay, so the take home message here is that markets reflect our human nature. And our human nature is one of morality. Morality is what keeps us embedded in the social group. If we're not moral, if we don't have the moral rules of what's appropriate to do and not to do, we haven't internalized those physiologically, then we're stuck with another system, which is always being monitored, people telling us what to do, and stealing the money whenever we can. If we're reciprocal creatures, then we can live in a decentralized society. We have a large group of individuals that we can interact with, and when we have that large group of individuals, then the wealth creation is optimized. So that's really what the biology is looking like. It looks like for most people, most of the time, as long as you have choice, we have lots of opportunities to interact. And so that's the sense in which markets are moral. They depend on our moral character. Without that, we'd have Big Brother in every transaction. And we've tried that model. It's called the Soviet Union, right? Where I tell you who you wreck with, how much, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't work because it crowds out our innate reciprocity. When we have freedom of choice, we say, John, great guy. I'd like to do a business deal with him. Now, if he takes advantage of me, if he screws me over, I have some recourse. Right? I'm going to get aggressive. I'm going to try to get that back, and I'm never going to do business with him again. Right? So as long as we have enough freedom of choice, this system can kick in. So I think that's actually really new knowledge, that this sense that we all have, that we are reciprocal creatures, that we are doing things that are win-win solutions, actually has a real biological basis. That's it. Uh, so try the experiment, uh, ask some questions, and see if you can convince people that it's our innate morality that's reflected in markets that allows um, all kinds of competition to occur, but in a sense in which we're respecting other people's autonomy, independence, and their own sense of reason. Yeah, thank you for listening.